Welcome, explorers of history, to a place where time stands still and the secrets of the ancient world beckon us to uncover their mysteries. In this episode, we embark on an extraordinary journey to one of Egypt's hidden wonders, the Maidim Pyramid, a silent witness to the passage of millennia. Join us as we step into the footsteps of pharaohs, architects, and laborers who crafted this enigmatic structure, and unravel the story behind its evolution from a vision in the desert to an architectural marvel. Get ready to unlock ancient secrets, traverse hidden chambers, and experience the awe-inspiring journey of the Maidim Pyramid. So, grab your virtual passports, and let's embark on an adventure that spans centuries and bridges the gap between ancient aspirations and modern fascination. Don't go anywhere. The Maidim Pyramid awaits, and the stories it holds are ready to be unveiled. Maidim. Maidim, also known as Maidim or Maidim, is an archaeological site located in Egypt. It is situated around 100 kilometers, 62 miles, south of Cairo, the capital city of Egypt. In the Beni Souf Governorate of Egypt, near the ancient site of the Maidim Pyramid. This area holds special significance in the history of ancient Egyptian architecture, as it contains a pyramid. This pyramid is considered the final stage in the evolution of the Stepped Pyramid, and it is also the last connecting link between the Stepped Pyramid and the Complete Pyramid. The Excavations in the Maidim Region The first scientific excavations in this area were conducted by the French Egyptologist Maspero, and this took place in 1882. He was the first to enter the Maidim Pyramid. Prior to Maspero's excavations in this area, there were earlier excavations by Burton and Weiss, but they were not of significant importance. This occurred in the year 1839. In 1890, the archaeologist Petrie conducted excavations in the Maidam area, assisted by Wainwright. During these excavations, they discovered parts of a wooden coffin in a burial pit, which they believed to be associated with King Sneferu. In 1981, Petrie and Wainwright uncovered the funerary temple of the pyramid. At that time, this temple was considered the oldest funerary temple in ancient Egypt until the funerary temple of the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara was discovered. Petrie published two books about those excavations, and for many years, they remained the primary source of information about the Maidam region. In 1927, Burchard examined the Maidam Pyramid and wrote an article containing detailed architectural drawings of the Maidam Pyramid. In 1929-1930, a University of Pennsylvania expedition conducted excavations in this area, focusing its attention on the temple and the surrounding parts near the pyramid. They did not pay much attention to the pyramid itself. The current mission leader, Alan Rowe, has published a preliminary report about the expedition's excavations. In the 1960, the Italians Marigiolio and Rinaldi did some investigation as part of their multi-volume work, L'Architettura della Piramide Menfite. The Maidam Pyramid. The Maidam Pyramid, named for the region it resides in, presents a perplexing architectural enigma. Its current appearance is unsettling. Additionally, this monument is distinctly isolated from other pyramids of the Old Kingdom period, which are in area like Giza. It can be argued that the pyramid was not 100% completed. That's combined to make the Maidam pyramid an overlooked and somewhat disparaged construction, and the destruction inflicted upon this pyramid. However, the most perplexing question for anyone who visits or sees this pyramid in pictures is whether this is the shape its builder intended it to have or if something happened that led it to assume this form. If there was a change in its appearance, was it due to human intervention or the effects of nature and weathering over the ages? Stages of Pyramid Construction Burchart revealed the Maidam Pyramid was built in three distinct stages. The initial stage, named E1, featured a seven-course high-stepped pyramid. The subsequent stage, E2, slightly enlarged the pyramid to reach eight courses in height. Finally, Stage E3 transformed the stepped pyramid into a true angled pyramid with an angle of approximately 52.6 degrees. Phase E1, step pyramid of 7 steps. Width of core approximately 60 cubits, layer 1 and 2 approximately 10 cubits thick. Layers 3 and 4 are thinner approximately 7.5 cubits. Layers 5, 6, 7 and 8 all approximately 10 cubits. Phase E2, layer 9 added approximately 10 cubits. Pyramid enlarged to 8 steps. Phase E3, 
Step pyramid converted to smooth pyramid 275 by 175 cubits. Present state. The smooth face of layer 5 between the two bands is the only visible part of E1 finished casing. The large band below is part of the exposed undressed layer of E1. The thin band above is part of the height extension of E2. The phase E3 has lost about two-thirds of its material. E2 has lost its top step and half of its next step. It has also lost its step on layer 6 and most of its step on layer 7. E1 is the most intact with only a small part of its top step and a portion of its layer 6 missing. It is thought that the robbing of stone from the pyramid had begun by Ramesses II and in the debris intrusive burials believed from the 22nd dynasty were found up to 10 meters from the pyramid base. In Petrie's time he describes quarrying activities still ongoing by the locals. The who, when and why of its destruction may never be known with certainty and we must be grateful that its remote location has in some way saved it from total destruction. The layers of the pyramid. Our understanding of the layers owes much to Wainwright, who ventured beneath the pyramid's surface. He encountered a total of nine layers, each rooted in the natural bedrock. Interestingly, the casing phase E3 didn't rest on rock, but on sand. In fact, the baseline of E3 sits 2.5 meters higher than the rock foundations of E1 and E2. Wainwright delved through ten distinct faces, with the tenth being the boundary between the first layer and the core. He pushed his tunnel an additional 254 inches at this juncture, yet no further faces greeted him. This suggests the presence of a solid core measuring 60 cubits in width at the heart of the pyramid. In general, the layers exhibit a remarkable similarity in thickness. The thicker layers range from a minimum of 194 inches to a maximum of 204 inches. However, a distinct deviation is evident in layers 3 and 4, which measure 152 inches in thickness. This alteration in the layer dimensions might have been a deliberate choice by the architect to enhance the visual perspective of the top of the step pyramid. It's worth noting that the first layer appears to align with the juncture of the entrance passage and the rock foundation. Moreover, in proximity to this junction, there's an intriguing observation. The relieving corridor, which was uncovered by Giles Dormion and Jean E. Verdert in 2000, appears to terminate against a monolithic stone that is positioned perpendicular to the slope. The term, accretion layers, commonly denotes the nine layers. These distinct layers of stone are not placed vertically, but rather inclined inward. This construction technique was prevalent during the Third Dynasty. The pyramid known as the Layer Pyramid at Zaviyat el Aryan offers a rough representation. This construction technique becomes even more refined in the Midam Pyramid. Here, the outer faces of the layers are meticulously finished with well-squared and precisely fitted blocks, concealing a core of more roughly shaped blocks. The layers, however, do not operate in complete isolation from one another. Wainwright makes the following observation during the tunnel excavation, and say, On coming to this eighth of the inner faces, we exposed a considerable surface, and found that it was banded just as are those that are visible higher up the system being to lay a number of smooth courses and then to build another coat outside this structure, raising it to the top of the prepared face. A thick platform of masonry was then laid over the hole, breaking joint with the prepared face. On the top of this platform, which had now been covered in on all four sides and the top, the prepared face was once more carried up in the plane of that inner one far below. Though those prepared bands in each face are all in a plane of those above and of those below, Yet there is no connection whatever between any given one and that above or below it, which seems to be a very remarkable feat of construction. Here we see the large rough band in the smooth casing of E1 above it. The remnants of smooth casing in the foreground are also part of the lower step of E1. Visible at the top of the rough band, one can see the stone protruding below the smooth casing. This is thought to be part of the bonding platform. The quality of the stone. Petrie says, the inner masonry, within each of the finished faces is very rough. No attempt has been made to fit the blocks, except by selecting chance adjustments. The courses are approximately equal, but a coarse mortar is largely used to fill the hollows that are left. The stone also is very inferior, brittle, splitting, stained and weathering badly. The outer faces, on the contrary, are of excellent stone, weathering to a rich brown, and seldom crumbling away 
and the smoothness of the faces and of the jointing is very fine. The comparison can be made between the quality of the completed casing stones and the rough infill. Evidently, the prominent large holes visible on the structure today are the result of local inhabitants creating them to attract bats and gather guano, a highly effective fertilizer favored by farmers. There isn't a significant variation in the thickness of the casing. For instance, Petrie reports the average thickness of the rough band to be approximately 20.3 inches, while various sections of the smoother sides measure between 23.6 and 17.8 inches. The substantial opening on the northern face was documented by the English traveler W. G. Brown back in 1793. Marigiolio and Rinaldi held the belief that the materials and craftsmanship used in E1 and E2 were identical, leading to the conclusion that this initial expansion occurred shortly after the original construction. However, when it comes to phase E3, they state, the diversity of materials used in this third stage, in contrast to the consistent materials used in the first and second stages, suggests that it was completed in a period that may not have been significantly later but was certainly distinct from that of the first two. There is a suggestion that Sneferu returned to Midam approximately 15 years after Phase E2 to convert it into a smooth pyramid. What has been discovered by Petrie and other researchers are various markings on stones and date marks ranging from the 7th to the 18th cattle counts. However, no ruler's name has been found. Petrie mentioned many of these markings when clearing the eastern face and apparently also within Wainwright's tunnel. Nevertheless, there seems to be little contextual information about where these marks are located, which makes it challenging to establish a clearer timeline for the construction. This is not surprising given that the date marks seem to be found on scattered blocks with unknown original locations. The Pyramid Entrance the entrance to the pyramid is located on the northern side of the pyramid at a height of 30 meters above ground level. The entrance today is still in pretty good condition and surrounded by surviving casing stones of E3. The floor of the entrance passage Petrie gives is 720.7 inches above the pavement of E3, which is about 35 cubits. The width is 32.2 inches at the top and 34.3 inches at the base. The well-preserved entrance, coupled with observations by Petrie and Rowe, provides insights into how the entrance was sealed. At the entrance, the passage walls are constructed using three courses of stones. Further inside, the passage walls are reduced to only two courses. This pattern continues until reaching the face of E2, where three courses reappear briefly before reducing to two once again. This pattern repeats itself until the face of E1 is reached. These three course segments are necessary to effectively conceal the entrance and seamlessly integrate it with the existing casing. To further camouflage the entrance on the face of E3, the bottom two courses have vertical faces that are cut away to create an inward slope. Casing stones with tapered shapes would be placed into these cuttings, resulting in the three casing stones closing the entrance having vertical joints that are not aligned but offset, similar to the neighboring casing stones. This illusion is further enhanced by using two adjacent blocks to form the door threshold. Beyond this point, the passage floor is constructed using single blocks. The lintel above the entrance is likely the only clue for potential robbers, as it is noticeably longer than the neighboring stones and in a course of greater height. This concealment method observed on E3 is not repeated at the entrance of E2, as there are no visible cuttings, and the entrance of E1 is too badly damaged. Petrie gives the length of the passage as 2,247.6 inches, which is approximately equal to 57.09 meters. Marigolio and Rinaldi believed that Rowe's measurement of 57.85 meters was likely more accurate than other measurements. In the end of the passage, there a small pit can be found in the passage floor, and to the south of this pit, there is a groove that runs along the walls, floor, and roof. Fragments of wood were discovered within this groove. It's a wooden frame with a hinged door. It is believed that there is lower chambers, that the lower chambers were excavated within a trench carved into the rock. This means that the end of the passage floor consists of masonry courses constructed on top of the rocky floor, and the paving stones in the lower chambers also rest upon the rocky floor within the trench. The pit, which spans the entire width of the floor and is approximately 55 centimeters wide, descends vertically through the masonry for a depth of 2.14 meters from the northern face of the pit. At this depth, it reaches the floor of the rock trench. However, 
The pit continues vertically for an additional 78 centimeters within the natural rock. The lower chambers. The lower chambers are relatively small and have identical dimensions, measuring 5 cubits in length by 2.5 cubits in width, excluding the passage width. The descending passage leads directly into the east chamber through a 15 cm step. The flooring stones in the horizontal passage and side chambers all rest on the floor of the trench. Each chamber consists of three masonry courses, with a smaller course at the bottom. The roofing blocks are substantial, as they need to span approximately 2.2 meters of chamber and passage. The east chamber is exited through a very short corridor, measuring 60 cm in length, before entering the western chamber. The corridor exiting this western chamber continues southwards for approximately 4.55 meters, where it meets the south wall of the vertical shaft that leads to the main chamber. In these small chambers, a few small blocks of limestone measuring 52.5 x 42 by 36.5 centimeters were discovered, which are somewhat similar to those found in the chambers of the Bent Pyramid. There's a suggestion that these small chambers were used to store plugging blocks that might have been too large to be transported down the descending passage after any burial. And it's interesting to note how similar their layout is to the Red Pyramid. I suspect there might have been only one plug block in the vertical shaft leading to the main chamber. Regarding the small blocks found, it's possible that Sneferu introduced them to reinforce any structural defects. There have been reports of cracks in the masonry, which are still visible today. In fact, these chambers appear to be just as damaged as the descending passage. The height of the chambers and the horizontal passage from the floor pavement is approximately 1.8 meters. The placement of these chambers may have been intentionally aligned with the NS and EW axes of the pyramid. According to Marigiolio and Rinaldi, the center axis of the descending passage is situated 90 centimeters east of the NS axis of E3. It's plausible that the initial lower chamber, the easternmost one, was meant to be positioned to the east of the pyramid's NS axis, while the subsequent chamber to the west of this axis. Both chambers would likely have been situated to the north of the EW axis. The primary chamber would be situated south of the EW axis, and the chamber would be divided in a manner where its entrance and the floor aligned with it were to the east of the NS axis, while the larger portion of the floor would be to the west. The challenges posed by the poor construction accuracy of Maida make it difficult to fully reconstruct the architect's intentions. However, the later, more precisely constructed pyramids do appear to demonstrate intentional placement of chambers in relation to the pyramid's axis. The vertical shaft. The horizontal corridor extends from the westernmost chamber and continues southward, leading to the vertical shaft. The height of the shaft from the corridor pavement to the main chamber pavement is approximately 6.25 meters. Presently, the corridor pavement in the area around the shaft is absent, and the rock floor of the trench has been excavated deeper to a depth of 80 centimeters from the top of the pavement level. Additionally, it seems that the lower edge of the lower block on the north wall of the shaft has been cut away. The eastern groove is disrupted by four rough blocks that sealed the relieving corbels above the corridor. In Dormion's photographs, the groove does not seem to exist on these blocks. Instead, the blocks appear to be set back compared to the adjacent stones. Currently, these blocks have been removed, allowing a view inside the corbelled space. In this corbelled space, Marigiolio and Rinaldi describe a 10 cm diameter wooden beam that was tenoned into the north wall. Although it's broken, a portion of it protrudes several centimeters. The beam is roughly at the same level as the chamber floor. Directly above this beam, there's a wooden board about 5 cm wide and 40 cm deep that fills the uppermost corbel space. The blocks that closed the lower corbel space were also approximately 40 cm deep. According to Dormion, the blocks that covered the corbelled space were poorly connected with gypsum. They appeared to follow the shape of the corbels on the east side, but on the west side, the wall was cut in a trapezoidal shape to a depth of 13 cm and filled with small stone fragments. The north wall of the shaft consists of masonry blocks. In contrast, the east, west, and south walls have been covered with very thin limestone tiles. Where the tiling has fallen off, the natural rock beneath is clearly visible. The main chamber provides a view of the vertical shaft entering the main chamber in the northeast corner. The floor is mostly absent in the northern half of the chamber. 
The north and south walls are perpendicular. The corbelled chamber has seven overhangs, and it's interesting to note that these overhangs are not at the same level as the corresponding overhangs on the opposing wall. In a way, there is a hidden overhang. The small patches of stone by the chamber floor are just thick slabs of stone that cover the overhang of the first masonry course that lies on the leveled rock. The floor of the chamber has been further excavated in the rock by some 80 centimeters. Three of the overhangs have had their lower edges chamfered. The first overhang on the east wall is chamfered along its length. This may have been done so as not to interfere with bulky items that came up the shaft. The fifth overhangs on both walls also have their lower edges chamfered along their length. These might be connected to the beams found on the overhang above that are present at the north and south end of the chamber. For example, a taut rope may have been connected to the two beams and used as a sort of gantry. The chamfered edges could help for bulkier items or the splaying of guide ropes. The second and third overhangs have square holes on both walls at the north end and appear connected to transport of items up the shaft. A piece of surviving beam is present in one of them. A feature often unnoticed is the long bank found against the north wall, Marijolio and Rinaldi say. Along the north wall, between the shaft and the west wall, was later cut in the rock during the construction of C. A long bank rising about 30-35 cm from the floor and 30-40 to 40 cm wide. This bank is very roughly dressed. Also the blocks forming the masonry of the walls, the overhangs and the pavement have been barely squared. It has been suggested that the chamber was left unfinished, but I doubt this is the case. The chamber, it is fair to say, has suffered the ravages of time, be it salt incrustation, human damage etc. The chamber has many signs of damage. There are frequent stone patches on the walls, large chips and pieces of stone missing. The chambers would have been completed very early in the course of the Midem project and given the differing phases present, surely there was ample time to finish the chambers. The chamber itself isn't particularly large. It has a height from the pavement to the roof of the last overhang measuring 5.05 meters, a width of 2.65 meters, and a length of 5.9 meters. The square holes on the west wall, as provided by M and R, have some specific measurements. The first hole closest to the north wall starts at a distance of 43 centimeters from the northern wall and is 21 centimeters wide. There is a gap of 76 centimeters until the start of the next hole on the same overhang, which is 27 centimeters wide. The hole in the overhang above is 25 centimeters wide and slightly north of the 27 centimeters hole so their north and south sides nearly align. Looking south, we can see the surviving pavement stones laid on the rock. Also in view is the excavation in the south wall and the chamfered edge on the first overhang on the east wall. There is hardly a block in the chamber not damaged in some form or other. Looking along the east wall, we can see a piece of beam in one of the square holes. The other two square holes are just visible above and to the right of it. Also visible are some patches of stone near the joint lines that are quite widespread in the chamber. Looking down the shaft we can see some of the wooden board and beam in the north wall, below that a hole that is part of the corbelled space that originally would have been closed with a stone block. To the right of these features, there appears to be a depression and some damage to the east wall. Hamilton says, once the decision to seal the chamber was made, the following sequence of events may have been done. First. The corbelled space in the north wall of the shaft would be walled up. The trapezium cut mentioned by Dormion on the west wall of the space was probably made to aid in inserting the four blocks and then patched up with the small pieces of stone. Next, the 10 cm beam would be inserted along with a 5 cm wide wooden board. The four blocks and board would sandwich and hold fast the beam. This beam would probably only protrude into the shaft a short distance and its function would be to provide a backstop to prevent any intruders from attempting to push the portcullis block up the shaft. The board, beam and blocks in the space are 40 centimeters deep. A beam would be placed across the width of the chamber along the bank on the north wall and possibly engage into a recess in the east wall. Wedges could be added to the end of the beam against the west wall to tighten things. Alternatively, or as well, the beam could have been supported by rope from the beam that is vertically above it. The relieving chambers. The relieving chambers, spaces can be seen above the two lower chambers, the lower end of the descending passage, and the corridor leading to the shaft. 
Dormion and Verder discovered these unknown spaces between 1998 2000. They were concerned about the large span that the roof beams of the lower chamber had to cover and wondered if a weight relieving system was present above. The Pyramid Temple The Pyramid Temple was discovered by Petrie, after much arduous and dangerous work in clearing the debris from the east face. It is accurately centered on the east face, being only 2.1 inches south of the face axis. It is built onto the face of E3 but the temple is not bonded or joined to the casing stones of E3. Petrie reports that there is a slight batter on the outer faces of the temple, amounting to 5.5 slope inward on 90 height. The tops of the walls are curved and apart from later graffiti, the temple is devoid of any decoration. It appears quite austere and bare. The inner passages are roofed over by large stone slabs. Outside of this we have two uninscribed stella and a small courtyard. The entrance is similar in width to the pyramid passage and the outer walls where they have not been dressed down appear three cubits thick. A short walk north along a corridor, 48 inches by 237 inches long another doorway of the same width as the entrance appears through a wall of two cubits thick. These two doorways have not their sides aligned with the north and south walls, but set back from the walls from 6.2 to 7.7 .7 inches. The next space is wider than the preceding corridor at 75.5 inches. The chamber length is the same at 237 inches. The next doorway is located in the middle of the wall that leads out to the courtyard. This wall is also 2 cubits thick and the doorway is wider than the other two at 61 inches or 3 cubits. The courtyard at pavement level is 237 by 92 inches. In the courtyard we have an altar placed between the two stella. The two stella Petri gives as 8 cubits high, 1 cubit thick and 2 cubits wide. He also describes them as standing on low bases with sloping sides. Petri states that the temple lay on a footing of about 17 inches. The six courses of masonry that make up the walls vary from 13.4 to 16.4 inches high and do not match the corresponding E3 course heights. The top of the fifth course equates to the top of the entrance, about 77 inches, the lintel above is 13.7 inches thick, to give total wall height of 90.7 inches. The thickness of the roof about 14 inches, gives a total of 104.7 inches, close to 5 cubits. Generally the temple is described as being made from Tura limestone. The north wall of the temple rests up against the casing of E3. The damage apparent on the casing is quite distinct to that of the temple wall, which seems strange. Outside of the temple Marijolio and Rinaldi say. No trace of a stone pavement has been found in the court surrounding the pyramid. Some remains of a paving or of a footway in mud or mud bricks have been observed from the end of the causeway to the temple door. The overall impression is of a temple that has been mostly completed but for some reason during the finishing stages, work appears to have stopped. This may explain the numerous undressed areas of the temple, the uninscribed stella and perhaps the missing pavement. What was found in this temple that is most important is some inscriptions on its inner walls, referred to as graffiti. These inscriptions were left by some of the temple's visitors in ancient times. The oldest of these inscriptions date back to the late Old Kingdom, but most of them belong to the modern ages, especially the 18th dynasty. One of these inscriptions is dated to the reign of King Senwasret III and was written by a scribe named Akibraker Seneb. These inscriptions, or most of them, refer to King Sneferu. This supports the ancient Egyptians' belief about who built this pyramid and temple, suggesting that King Sneferu was the one responsible for their construction. The Parabolus Wall The wall that encircles the pyramid, referred to by Petri as the Parabolus Wall, surrounds the pyramid in a rectangular shape. The Parabolus Wall around the pyramid has been entirely destroyed, excepting the foundation stones in most parts, and the lower course of wall in the deep chip rubbish on the south side. In some parts even the foundations are gone, and their place can only be traced by the hole being filled with sand, against the chip and stone dust bed which formed a pavement outside of it. Petri thought the wall to be 57 inches thick with a height of 70 or 80 inches, based on a fallen causeway block. The east and west walls are practically equal. The east is 9,307 inches long and the west 9,300 inches. The north and south sides show a greater discrepancy. North wall is 8,561 inches and south 8,479 inches. 
Petrie says, the design for the breadth of the parabolus is pretty clear, as 1420.4 inches is a quarter of the base of the pyramid, so that the enclosure was half as wide again as the pyramid. The 1420 inches is the distance of the outside of the east and west walls to the pyramid base. The north and south walls are not equidistant to the pyramid base. The north wall is about 780 inches further from the pyramid base than the south wall. North wall distance is 2,203 and south wall 1,393 inches. Petrie's scheme for east and west walls means that an E3 base of 275 cubits gives a wall distance of 68 and 3 quarters cubits, one quarter pyramid base. Therefore total distance from east to west is 412.5 cubits. The mean length of the north and south walls is 8,520 inches. Divided by 412.5 provides a cubit of 20.65 inches which is in the normal range for Egyptian cubits. This spacing between the north and south walls, Petrie says, I fail to see any reasonable hypothesis. Hamilton says, having looked at this puzzle I have devised a possible solution. Petrie's idea of using the pyramid base as a relationship to the east and west walls, made me think of the other quantity that defines a pyramid and that is its height, which Petrie gives as 175 cubits. The south wall at 1,393 inches, I suggest was intended to be the same as the east and west walls of 1,420 inches, or 68 and 3 quarters cubits. The north wall I suggest was intended to be 106 and a quarter cubits from pyramid base. Using a cubit of 20.65, this would be 2,191 inches. The scheme means that the pyramid height has a relationship with the north-south walls and the pyramid base has a relationship with the east-west walls. As 68 and 3 quarters plus 106 and a quarter equals 175 cubits or pyramid height and 68 and 3 quarters plus 68 and 3 quarters equals 137.5 or half base length. The only entrance through the wall was on the east side about 25.5 meters from the temple entrance. Before the entrance there is a rectangular enclosure and it has been suggested that maybe statues could have been placed at its ends. This enclosure opens out onto the causeway and on the north and south walls of the causeway at this point, there appear to be entrances. Inside the parabolus wall two other structures were found, a tomb to the northwest and a subsidiary pyramid to the southwest. The subsidiary pyramid. Hamilton says, This structure has been so destroyed that its original form may never be known. The superstructure has gone entirely along with most of its substructure. Only a few stones remain in proximity to the remains of a sloping entrance passage. Marijolio and Rinaldi thought that the structure was a 50 cubit wide step pyramid of four steps and layers of five cubits width. The foundations of the outer layers appear to be laid in a trench inclined at 30 degrees towards the center and about 28 meters square. The pyramid chamber was built in a pit some 4 meters deep, about 8 meters wide in unknown length and it is thought one small room was built. The surviving descending passage was plugged by two limestone blocks and apparently the northern end of the passage still lies under a huge pile of debris and has not been excavated. In the central pit burials dating to the 22nd dynasty were found. Marijolio and Rinaldi believe that the structure was a stepped layer pyramid, and believe the structure may be linked with the E1 or E2 phases. There is only a 5 meters gap between E3 and the structure and the vertical shaft and vaulted horizontal passage that leads to the pit south of the pyramid, may have been another entrance to the structure, caused by the enlargement of E3. Maybe further excavation could shed more light on the structure. The Northern Tomb The northern tomb inside the parabolus wall lies to the northwest, Petrie states. On the north of the pyramid we found a strange form of tomb. A small mastaba, 50 feet wide, and probably 100 feet long, stood in the parabolus enclosure. On the north side near the ground a sloping passage led down. The rock cutting for this was nearly 15 feet wide, and the building of it was splendid, with great beams and blocks of fine white limestone. The passage was plugged with stone, below which a door slid in grooves. And yet after about 20 feet the end of all this fine work was reached, and only an ignoble little room cut in the soft muddy marl contained the burial. And the roof of this had readily fallen and filled the chamber, in entire contrast to the splendid 14-foot beam of limestone which roofed the entrance to the chamber. 
Where sharp contrasts of work are found, they are commonly supposed to be due to neglect. But here the rough crumbling chamber must have been cut first, and the massive stone passage was added in front of it, quite incongruously. The approach and causeway. While excavating on the east of the pyramid Gerald Wainwright discovered the approach, which he describes as a well-made causeway that was very carefully constructed. To maintain a constant incline of approximately 10 degrees, the rock would be excavated to a depth of 8 feet. Areas that were lower than the line of the incline were banked up by a mound of rubbish, enclosed by a mud plaster facing wall. The cutting in the rock was 201 inches wide, in this cutting two walls of rough stones covered in mud plaster was made, reducing the width to 123 inches. This space between the walls was paved with crude brick. On each mud wall a red line was drawn with an even slope. One large limestone block was found in situ on the brick paving, and the upper surface of this block coincided with the red line, suggesting that the red lines were guides for the limestone paving. It is not known if the approach was ever finished, or if the valuable limestone paving was removed before the approach was filled and concealed with debris. The lower two-thirds of the approach are covered in clean white chip. Marijolio and Rinaldi say the approach had an azimuth of about 100 degrees with respect to north. The end of the approach near the pyramid is unclear. It may be that the approach was just a causeway that started from the lower cultivation and terminated on the level surface of the desert on the east side of the pyramid. As far as we know there appears to be no earlier parabolous wall, connected with phase E2. The end of the approach in the cultivation is unknown, as the area has not been excavated, due to the high water table in this location. All we know is that a wall of crude brick about 65 to 75 inches wide, that was connected to the later causeway runs across the approach. The later causeway appears to belong to phase E3, and like the approach, it leads from the cultivation and terminates at the parabolous wall entrance. Mostly destroyed. Petrie thought it was an open causeway and from a surviving coping stone, thought the walls to be about 66 at base and 90 inches high, with a batter of 1 in 10 on the sides. Like the approach, we know little of the east end, the form of the valley temple etc., due to the groundwater problems. In conclusion, the pyramid complex of Sneferu at Maidam is a fascinating archaeological site that offers a glimpse into the architectural and engineering marvels of ancient Egypt. From its mysterious inner chambers and chambers to the enigmatic temple structures and causeways, this pyramid complex continues to captivate historians, archaeologists, and Egypt enthusiasts alike. The pyramid's evolution from its early, unsuccessful attempts to its final majestic form is a testament to the unwavering dedication and ingenuity of the ancient Egyptians. The questions and mysteries surrounding Maidam, such as the purpose of its multiple entrances, the ceiling of certain chambers, and the relationship between its various phases, remind us that the past still holds many secrets waiting to be uncovered. As we explore the intricate details and enigmas of Maidam, we're reminded of the rich history and culture of ancient Egypt, a civilization that continues to inspire wonder and curiosity. So, whether you're a seasoned Egyptologist or just someone with a passion for history, the Maidam Pyramid Complex invites us all to embark on a journey back in time and marvel at the wonders of the ancient world. Thank you for joining us on this expedition, and may our collective curiosity continue to illuminate the shadows of history.